Um, Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> I saw something yesterday um, on the way home. Um, we, got home we got home about 10.30 last night. And I, I saw this in Galatians and I thought, you know, this is, there's, there's something neat here. Um, this is going to be a, a teaching on what salvation really is. And salvation is more than a doctrinal statement. Salvation is more than uh, someone praying a prayer. Um, Pastor Cooley s says it this way. He doesn't believe in once prayed, always saved. Um, because that idea, it tells people that they can feel bad one day, one Sunday or whatever and pop off a little prayer and then they can then go out and do whatever they want to do and live like a dog for the rest of their life and God still gives them heaven. And that is not salvation. It's not, it's not what we're going to learn. You may already know this, but you may not know all the scriptures that pertain to it. But being saved is that there is a new man in you. And I'll never forget... Um, if you remember Brady and Bradley Crum, uh, those two boys, even though they were involved in cults for uh, their early teen years, one was a Mormon, one was a Jehovah's Witness. Um, they both came here and, and learned what real salvation was all about. Now understand, these guys have been reading their Bible for most of their life. They've been studying the scriptures. When their dad got saved, in the hospital. I mean, he got saved literally 15 minutes before the doctor came into his room and told him he was going to die of cancer. And I could tell it was real in him. I could tell it. And two days later, um, they discharge him from the hospital. His boys are going to take him to the pharmacy to get his medicine. Keith Crum said this. He said, boys, he said, I, I feel different. And he said, I, he said, it's hard to explain, but he said, don't think I'm weird, but he said, I feel like I have someone living inside of me. Amen. That man knew in two days what it took those, his two sons to study in the Bible and going through all these cults that they went through. That man learned in two days what salvation's all about. There is somebody living inside of you, okay? In fact, there's, there's two of them. One of them we're going to kill, okay? He is no good thing dwelling in us. But the other guy is God's only begotten son, okay? So let's study that. Galatians chapter, chapter 1, um, Paul's given his... Resume, he's giving his, you know, where he came from. And we looked, last time I was here, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at Paul's conversion. And how, I mean, I didn't, I didn't cover all of this. Uh, you see the conversion itself in Acts chapter 9. Paul retells it in Acts chapter 22. He retells it again in Acts chapter 26. He's telling the story. Everywhere Paul went, he's telling people how he got saved. He's telling people about the day that he met Jesus. He knows the day. And that's my question to you. Do you know, do you remember the day? Do you remember the day when Jesus came to you, showed up? Okay, you may not have seen the light. You may not have seen him, but he was there nonetheless. So do you remember the day? And then Paul's telling it here again in Galatians. Um, in verse 11, chapter 1, but I certify you. Certify means to make certain, guaranteed. Brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I like to tell everybody, Paul went, instead of going to Peter and John and James to learn the doctrines, Paul went to Jesus Bible College. He literally received these teachings from Jesus himself, which is unique to, I guess, the office of apostle. This is why I'm not an apostle, never will be. Um, we have all the apostles, 
that we're going to have. We have the original 12, Judas was taken out, Matthias took his place, and then Paul, and then that's it. Um, but these doctrines were delivered directly to Paul, not through any other earthly ministry or agent. So he says that, I neither received it of man, verse 12, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my con conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, and underline that, When did God save you? And then could God have saved you earlier than what he did? Of course. But God wasn't ready because he knew you weren't ready. Now, when you look back at your past, you probably all have regrets. Major regrets. Things that if you could go back in a time machine and undo, you would do it in a heartbeat. Why did God allow you to get into that? Why did God allow you to, to break his law in such a horrendous way? It all had God's purpose to it. It all had God's plan to it. Why did God let Paul already be a persecutor of God's people? Going to Damascus was not his first rodeo. It was not his first time going to persecute and arrest Christians. He'd already gotten good at it. He was on a roll now. He's going to Damascus. He's going to bring them all in. Okay? So why did God allow all of that to happen? Because God is always about doing things in his time only. In his time. Write that down. Memorize that. Think about that that you asked God to do something, you begged God for something, you prayed to God. I sat with a guy one night as I was leading him to salvation and he said, Mike, I go to sleep almost every night, bawling my eyes out, ask, begging God to forgive me. But that night, that one night, was the night that God was going to do what he had been asking God to do all these, all these nights, all these tears, all these years, God waited until this one night. Okay? So that's what he's saying here. Uh, but when it pleased God, who separated from me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. And then he says in verse 16, to reveal his son and the phrase is, in me. His son, in me. I'm going to have to remember that. That's going to be the title of what we post on Sermon Audio. His son, in me. Ponder that. Because if you don't have Christ living in you, you're not saved. You're not born again. It's that simple. And like I said, a church does not tell you you're saved. A church cannot make you saved. A church cannot take away your salvation. And some churches believe that way. They say, we, if you do what we tell you to do and memorize and say what we tell you to say, then we declare that you're saved. But it's not man's declaration. Because how many church members are there in the world who are going to die and go to hell because they, a man or a organization told them they were saved, but they're not. And they've never had the inner, and there's different names for it. Christ living in us, God's son living in us, the new man, the inner man, the inward man. There's different names for it, but it's all the same idea that there is now someone with that we identify as God's son literally living inside of you, dwelling in you. Um, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. 
Paul's conversion and calling is similar to Pastor Reg Kelly. Reg Kelly said that he grew up in church, got a 20-year Sunday school attendance pin for 20 straight years of attending Sunday school, but was lost doing that. And he said, God saved me and called me to preach the same night. And that's what God did with Paul. He saved him and called him to preach in the same day. It didn't happen that way with me, but that's how it happened with Paul. And that was Brother Kelly's testimony. But he said that he called him and revealed his son in him that he might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So we're going to go through the scriptures now. You know me. We're going to look at what Paul meant here by to reveal his son not through me, but in me. So turn to John 15. John chapter 15. Those whales were amazing. I was talking about whales a while ago. Those whales were absolutely, they were beautiful. And right on cue, it's almost like the whales are on the payroll of the state of Alaska. Because we go out and we're seeing all these different groups of whales and it's time for the tour to end because the cruise ship's going to leave. Okay, so we're still out in the middle of the water. So the guy's saying, we got to go. And as we're about ready to leave, we see two more whales. And it turns out to be a mama and a baby whale. And, you know, they had, you've, if you've seen pictures of the whale tail sticking up in the air, we saw all that. But one of the neatest things is, is as we were leaving, the baby whale rolled over sideways and stuck its flipper up in the air and was doing like that. And I'm going, bye. Everybody was going, oh, that's so cute. And it just makes you think, you know, did they get a signal saying, okay, go, you know, wave to the people. But it, it, it's just, if you ever get a chance to go to Alaska, go to Alaska. You may not want to live there but you have to go there to see it anyway John chapter 15 here's how Jesus Jesus introducing the idea of him living and abiding in us so he says in John 15 I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman so get this idea here's Christ he is this vine and God his father the husbandman is the farmer He's the one who maintains the vine. If, um, if you've heard the term animal husbandry, okay, what that means is this man, um, he directs the breeding of horses or cattle or goats or, or whatever. And so a husbandman is the one who is the caretaker of cattle or the caretaker of an orchard or a vineyard. And that husbandman is the one who examines the vine. And if he sees a branch on that vine that is not producing, then what's he going to do? He's going to cut it off and toss it. And it's going to go into a burn pile. And it's gone because it did not bear any fruit. All it's doing is drawing nutrients away from the others that are producing. So he says that every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Being born again means that you will bear fruit, not produce it. My thought when I first became pastor of Bethel Church, my thought was, I had to perform. I had to produce. I had to bring people in. I had to grow the church. I had to maintain it. And it was on me to do it, which caused me then to start looking at how big churches got big. And that's when I, for a brief time, I was going to study Rick Warren. I was going to study Purpose Driven. I was going to, I was going to say, hey, we got to do something. We got to get people in. Because I thought it was on me to produce. And God whipped me. He took a rod to me and chastised me over that. What God was doing was he was not just correcting me. He was relieving me of a burden that I had placed on myself. Because he said, Mike, it is not you. 
that brings people in. It's me. It's never you, and it's never going to be you. And if you're not okay with that, I'll take you out, bring somebody into this church that I can work with. And it scared me. And I said, God, please don't do that. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. So that's, that's the thing. There are people who come to church who do not manifest fruit. Period. And if they do manifest fruit, it's going to be corrupt fruit. And a corrupt fruit does not come from a good vine. Corrupt fruit comes from a corrupt vine. It's, it's how we can tell who is and who isn't. If there's grapes, it's a grape vine. If there are apples, it's an apple tree. If there are thistles, it's a thistle. It's that simple. So he's, and Hebrews 6 bears that out. If it, that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing. So, he, so then, if he sees a branch not bearing fruit, he takes it away. But every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So what tribulation you went through, what trial you endured, what hardship you encountered, even what sins you committed after you were saved, that was God allowing it so he could manifest it, so he could then purge it. So you have this vine. Think of a vine. You have a vine, and then a branch grows off this vine. So that branch is you. And, of course, on that branch, there's going to be smaller branches you know, going this way and that. So let's say on you, you are manifesting fruit in one area of your life. But there's a part of you that doesn't do much for the Lord. There's a part of you that doesn't do much for any, doesn't do any good for anybody. God knows about that. Who's the husbandman? God is. Does the branch... Purge itself. It's never happened in history. Never happened in history that a branch plucked off one of its own branches because it didn't like it. The husbandman does that. So when we, when we teach from the Bible that you are the workmanship of God, that's not just some philosophical idea that makes us feel better about ourselves it is the actuality of how your life has gone up to this very moment you are not the product of your own doing you'll not sing at the end of your life i did it my way you want that one that's not you it's god in you and god god's ownership over you and you are the workmanship of God. You will be what God wants you to be. And nothing more and nothing less. Amen? So he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So what area of your life is not producing? God sees it. God's going to allow a time and then he's going to take, he's going to work something and he's going to purge you. He's going to take a rod to you. He's going to purging You've purged before, right? You ever purged? Yeah. It's not fun. But it does some good. Like you ate something, right? And it's not doing well in there. Okay? And you're going, you're moaning and groaning and whining and crying. And all of a sudden, you get that out. And once you get it out, you're going, oh, oh, that felt good. Okay? That's, that's how it is. It's not, Paul taught about this when he talked about, you know, when God chastens us, it's not, it's not joyous. It's not a wonderful time in the Lord, but it's going to do something good. Okay? When a woman has a child, the birth process itself is not fun. It's not good. But when the child is born, that's all forgotten. Okay? Instant relief. So, verse 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How are we clean? Word. The Bible. Abide in me and I in 
you. As the branch cannot, and think about this. Here's, here's the explanation of that. How is it that we live in Christ, but then Christ lives in us? So think about other scriptures. Psalm 119. Thy word hath I hid, where? Under a rock, under a bushel, under a pillow. Thy word hath I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Who is Christ? He's the word. Where is he? In your heart. So Christ is in you by way of his word abiding in you. And here again, someone says, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. But they don't believe the Bible. How can you have the word of God abiding in you when you don't believe it and you don't read it and you never will? How can that be? It's not possible. So this vine carries, it's just like in our bodies, this vine carries in it, this big grapevine carries in it in every cell a copy of its DNA. A copy of its DNA in every cell. And DNA is a book that God wrote that describes and defines all the members. Look around you. Look in this room. How many different types of people do we have in here? What? What? Black, white, yellow, and red. We got all the rainbow colors here. Okay? But God brought us all in here in the same place. I love it. Okay? Who wants to look at a rainbow that's all gray? Okay? I want different colors. So that's God. So in every branch is going to be a little different. But it's all the same DNA. Because in the, in the eventuality, at the end of what that branch is for, is to produce grapes. And what do grapes, what is the most important part of a grape? The seed that's in it. Because that's how God designed that that plant is going to reproduce. That bearing fruit means bearing seed. The book. Okay? So that's how Christ abides in us is through the word. How we abide in Christ is we're attached to the vine. So we are technically as much a part of Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ is. What part of your body does not belong on your body? None of it. What part of your body is detached from the rest of it? None of it. It's all covered by the same skin, connected by the same bones and the same tissues, and it all derives from the same DNA source. So that's how Christ abides in us, is through his word, his DNA. And that's how we abide in Christ, is that we are attached, literally, to our Savior Jesus Christ. We are as much of his body as anything else is. Okay? So, uh, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. So you take that branch, you got a fruit bearing branch. Oh, it's amazing. Cut that branch off. What's going to happen, Ron? It's going to die. It's going to die pretty quick. That's what he's saying here. So verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If that branch is not receiving the DNA, the word, the book, then it will not bear fruit. It will not bear fruit. But if you're right with God, you want to bear fruit. So how do we do it? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. 
Read it. Believe it. Some would say, read it and believe it is not all of it. You must apply it. I don't believe that. I think God applies it. Who's the husbandman? God is. We, who are, who is whose workmanship? Do, are we making God? No. God makes us in his image, in his likeness. And when it comes time for God's word to be manifested in our life, it will be manifested. Did Lazarus raise himself from the dead? It's not possible. He's dead. There's nothing about Lazarus that works. But what raised Lazarus from the dead? The words, Lazarus come forth. It was the word of God that brought Lazarus from the dead. Okay? So am I making my point very clearly? I'm, this, this to me is Bible Christianity 101. It's, this is the simplicity that is in Christ. If you'll read this book and you'll believe it, then God will apply it. God will manifest. God will work. God will purge. God will perform. This is what I've learned in life. And I am, I'm my biggest critic. My wife will tell you that. I criticize myself all the time. I'm not doing enough. I'm, I, you know, what drives me is once I know something, I'm not content with that. I want to know something else. Once I do something, I'm not content with that. I want to do something else. But see, that's God's workmanship in me. Okay? And if that desire is in you, wait on the Lord because he will perform it. I promise you he will. Um, I read something, well, I'm not even going to get to the rest of the lesson. This is going to take a while, but I read something this week. And I shared it with uh, a brother that um, we just happened to land in Salt Lake City yesterday. And we have a family that watches, that are watching now. Hi, guys. And uh, they said, great, you got a layover in Salt Lake City. We're taking you out to dinner. So we left the airport. <laughs> okay, we got back in time. And... But I, I shared this verse with them. I said, here's what God showed me this week. It's in Jeremiah. And I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have it memorized yet. But it's like, you're a tree. And God has planted you by a river of living water. That's, and it's very similar to what Psalm 1 says. Therefore, he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. And his leaves shall prosper and or his leaf shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper and and this verse in Jeremiah was almost identical to that because it said that now that it's planted by the river that root is always going to get nourishment so what happens then when it doesn't rain for a while is that tree worried so what if it doesn't rain for a while i'm tapped in and I'm going to abide while all the other trees are dying. Okay? And I'm saying this to you. You're always going to have seasons. Always. There's times you feel like reading the Bible. Times you don't feel like reading the Bible. But the times that you read the Bible, because you have grown and because God has has pulled your root in down. Maybe you're not by a surface river. Maybe you're tapped into one of those underground streams. There's billions of them under our feet right now. There's a well under our, uh, literally under this church. We used to get our water from a well at, and finally we had to give it up because we had ants in it all the time. But there's water underneath our church right now. And, be, even, and this works in a church, it works in a marriage, it works in a family, it works in every place. The more you read, the more you study, while you're feeling like it, you're growing. And that root is getting deeper. And there's always going to be a time when you don't feel like reading your Bible. And it might worry you. And it should. But how many times has that happened and you're still here? You know how? You were tapped in. You had a supply. Those whales, 
I, boy, I, I got my head full of this stuff. Those whales, those mama whales spend all this time right now feeding and getting huge. They're getting fat. Why? Because they got a 3,000 mile journey to take. By the time they get to Hawaii and give birth, they've lost hundreds of pounds in weight because there's not as much food where they're going. But how did they do that? How did they manage that? If, if the famine started today, I'll last a while. I'll abide a while. That's the purpose of fat in us, is that it sustains us so that we don't have to constantly eat to stay alive. And you read that Bible, and God gives you fat in you. He gives you water in you. So that when that sun's out, and there's trials going on, and you're not in the Word, and a famine's going on, you're going to survive. Because God made you fat during the season. I mean, what is it we know? We pick up weight toward the end of summer. Why? Because generally in wintertime, there's no, there's no growth, there's no vegetables in the garden, and no wheat in the field to eat. And we had to store it up, right? Had to store it up and save it. Your body does it and we do it. So that we last the winter time so that by the time spring comes around, we're still, we're still alive. And that's your life. This is what this is teaching us here. Okay? This vine is going to take very good care of the branches. The husbandman is going to take very good care of his branches. Don't you worry. God's got it. Amen? Now, it's not going to stop me from worrying, but, but it helps. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, while, while we feel like it, while the season is here, feed us. Make us fat. Give us plenty of excess. Because the lean times will come. They've been here before. But you've brought us through them. We've endured. But it's only because, Lord, that you built us up to do that. Father, we thank you, God, that our life is your workmanship and your work in us. Just like that's what Paul was saying. He revealed Jesus in Paul. Father, everywhere we go, to whoever we meet. Reveal your Son in us. Reveal your Word in us. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us today. Thank you, God, for time spent in the Bible. Sustain us, Lord, throughout this week. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.